very much. So I think you just saw a generational thing there too, where, where I mean, I'm nervous about using one of these clickers. Cell phone. I mean, this is. This is I'm, we're all impressed. So, so um, I would never try that. So, um, so last but not least is uh, Dr. Mel Krajden. So, um, Mel is the uh, associate medical director at BC Center for Disease Control. He's also the medical head of the uh, hepatitis clinical prevention services there. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting, just by way of introduction, I'll let you read his, his bio, I know you have that. You know, we, we have, um, we've done some amazing things in this province with infectious diseases. And again, it may be not be obvious to you that genomics is a real part of this, but if you take, for instance, the example of HIV, and you look at the decrease in mortality over, over the, I mean, you know, HIV now is a, is a treatable disease. And it wasn't always like that. The, de the mortality decreased by about 90% here in the province of BC over a fairly narrow period. And the reason for that, at the heart of that, again, is genomic technology. It's really, it allowed better surveillance for the virus. It allowed variant forms of the virus to be detected. But there's many more stories to be told in the province of BC around us that will really dramatically affect the population. And Dr. Krashen is here today to tell us about the hepatitis C story. Thanks, Mel. Thank you, Brad. I'm also delighted to be here. So, I'm going to talk about the discovery of hepatitis C. But uh, you should know that there's an alphabet of hepatitis viruses. Hepatitis A is a vaccine for, and it only causes acute disease and no chronic disease. <coughs> hepatitis B causes both acute disease and chronic disease. There's a vaccine for it. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about hepatitis C. There's also hepatitis D, which needs hepatitis B in order to cause a chronic disease. And then there's hepatitis E, which actually is an animal virus that infects humans and causes a lot of damage. So, um, hepar is the Latin term for liver, and itis is the term for inflammation. And when you get a chronic uh, hepatitis, like hepatitis C, over uh, decades you will develop cirrhosis, and then when what happens is the liver tissue gets replaced by fibrous tissue, and uh, eventually you're at risk of developing liver cancer. And so, uh, I don't know if you're a vegetarian, I would plug your ears, but uh, people eat calf liver, and if you have calf liver and it's uh, soft and tender and not overcooked, if it's overcooked it tastes like shoe leather, and uh, if that liver is actually damaged, and replaced by fibrous tissue, then it's like chewing, chewing gum. And so that what happens is your normal liver cells, which do about 500 different things in your body, uh, get replaced. You essentially uh, have uh, liver failure, and you can also develop cancer. So uh, in 1978, I was a medical student introduced to a patient with non-A, non-B hepatitis. That's because they hadn't yet discovered hepatitis C. And they knew that about 80 to 90 percent of cases of hepatitis C were due to post-transfusion hepatitis, or non-A, non-B. They knew that uh, it contaminated blood products that were used to treat hemophiliacs, those are people with clotting disorders. It was common in patients who underwent dialysis. It was common in people who injected drugs. Uh, you could sometimes get a needle stick injury and get hepatitis C. And there were about 10 to 25 percent who had sporadic cases of hepatitis C where they really didn't know uh, where they got this non-A, non-B hepatitis. They knew there was limited sexual transmission and that there was limited transmission from the mother to the child. But because they had no test for this agent and they hadn't discovered it, uh, you only saw the tip of the iceberg of the people who were infected with it. They knew that the agent was a virus, um, and they knew that it was about 30 to 60 nanometers in size. And basically 30 to 60 nanometers, you could fit 100,000 viruses over the width of a hair, and that's about the size <coughs> of a nanometer. But they knew that uh, you could prevent transmission by filtering the blood 
and it was this size of a virus. They knew that it was coated with fat or lipids because if you treated it with solvents, you could actually prevent transmission or detergents. And yet all of the efforts to identify the agent had failed by the late 1980s. So there was this company called Chiron Corporation, and companies don't discover things, people do. And the head lead there was a person by the name of Michael Houghton. They knew that chimpanzees could be infected with this non-A, non-B agent. They knew that a chimpanzee's blood could transmit to another chimpanzee. They knew on the basis of the size of the virus that it could have been a DNA virus or an RNA virus. And so they decided to try this very innovative technique, which was they took all the DNA and RNA in the blood, and they created DNA. And then they cloned that DNA into uh, what's called a expression vector. And essentially what happens is that material produces protein when it's cloned into E. coli, which is one of the bacteria that we all have in our gut. Except this case, you had about a million of these E. coli protein-making factories, each producing a random bit of protein that was found in the blood. And they took the blood of a patient who had acquired non-A, non-B hepatitis after having cardiac surgery. And the hope was that antibodies, which are the proteins you make in response to being exposed to an infection like influenza, would react with one of these proteins, one of these million proteins produced in these bacteria. And lo and behold, one protein was detected by this person's antibody. And it was published in the Wall Street Journal on May 11th, 1988. And the reason it was published there was it was really the cutting edge use of genomics to identify, clone and express non-A, non-B proteins without ever having seen the virus. And that virus was called hepatitis C and then published a year later uh, in time to get the patents. That discovery led to the first antibody test, which was used for blood screening and diagnosis, and we'll talk about the implications. And the protein they discovered was the C100 protein, and then they could use patients' antibody who were infected with non-A, non-B, show that it reacted, and then confirm that reaction using another antibody. And it made Chiron a lot of money. That discovery helped us understand hepatitis C transmission, showed that you could screen blood products and now your risks of developing hepatitis C from blood is about 1 in 4 million. It showed that deeply inject drugs account for about 80% of current infections in the developed world and that sadly unsafe needle practices uh, is a huge problem in the developing world and that there was indeed very limited sexual transmission, about 5% of infected mums would infect their kids, and a limited sexual transmission uh, in terms of uh, uh, sexual uh, interactions. Um, based on the development of this test, they showed that about 185 million people worldwide are infected, and in these countries there's extensive reuse of syringes, and the single most effective way of reducing transmission would be to use single-use syringes in these parts of the world. About 1.5% of British Columbians are infected, or about 70,000 people. There are four major groups who are affected in British Columbia. People inject drugs, where about 30 to 70% of the estimated 18,000 people are infected. About 25 to 60 percent are also co-infected because of shared risk factors. There's this big group, including many of us in this room, baby boomers who could have been infected from contaminated blood in the past, unsafe new practices in the past, or people may have tried drugs in the 60s. And about 3 percent of our baby boomers are infected with hepatitis C. Immigrants represent about 3%, many of them infected from unsafe needle practices. And Aboriginal people, through a variety of risk factors, have about 
a two to five-fold increased risk of being infected. In terms of the natural history, there's no vaccine for hepatitis C. <clears throat> there is one for hepatitis A and B. Only about 25% of people will manifest symptoms, so most people don't know that they're infected. About 25% will clear on their own. 75% uh, will stay infected, chronically infected. Of those infected, about one in four will develop cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, liver cancer, or require liver transplantation. And the disease progression takes multiple decades, as I pointed out earlier, and it is worse with alcohol and obesity. When you drink alcohol, it's a toxin. Your liver has to metabolize it. And if your liver is damaged from hepatitis C, it irritates your liver more. And also, those Big Macs, uh, the fat needs to be metabolized. And uh, that also is a hepatotoxin. So once they discovered the virus, the virus is coded for by RNA. And essentially, that RNA codes for both the shape of the virus, and viruses need to grow in cells, living cells. And in order to grow in living cells, they need proteins that enable the virus to take over those cells so it can grow and replicate. And so part of the proteins code for the structure of the virus. This is the envelope of the virus, the lipid component, and that helps to attach to certain cells. And it's by understanding the molecular biology that you can begin to uh, cure this infection. So initially, what they uh, did was to use interferon drugs, which is a protein that each of us produce when we get influenza, you feel achy, you feel sick, and essentially many of those symptoms are from influenza. And they found by mixing interferon with uh, ribavirin, they could cure about 50% of people. When they really discovered how the virus replicates through the molecular biology, they essentially created these designer drugs, which can now cure about 95% of people. They're called direct-acting antivirals. They target many parts of the genome. And uh, yesterday, two drugs were approved for public funding in British Columbia. And these drugs are taken for as little as 8 to 12 weeks. Virtually no side effects compared to interferon, which we take for 24 to 48 weeks and feel like you had a flu for that period of time, and essentially cure greater than 95% of people, even those who have cirrhosis. So what happens when you cure hepatitis C? They've shown that you could reduce uh, the risk of dying by 62 to 84%. Uh, a reduction in liver cancer by about 68 to 79% and a 90% reduction in the need for liver transplantation. And the current formulations are taking one pill, a combination pill, for a period of 8 to 12 weeks. So what are the questions facing policymakers? How best to test? How best to screen? Who and when to treat these people? What are the costs? Can we prioritize treatment to those that need it most? Can that avert existing health care system costs, and what is the provider capacity that's needed to actually ramp up treatment. And genomics still has value. And where we use genomics now is to essentially, at the time of diagnosis, try to understand whether it's a new infection or an older infection. So with a new infection, you find that the virus, which mutates very, very rapidly, has very low diversity. And if you have a chronic infection, you have a high diversity. And this is important so you can understand at the time of diagnosis whether this is a new infection, which should be prevented, or it's an older infection, which likely requires treatment. We can also compare the sequences between different viruses. And you can measure the genetic distance between two hepatitis C viruses. And what we do is we look at the genetic distance between the same individual over different time points and use that to understand how the virus is being transmitted currently in the population. Because the virus is so different, uh, if the sequence is different, it means that the transmission pattern is different.
And yet, if you identify the light blue person versus the dark blue person, the fact that the virus is so similar, you can identify that these two transmission cases were related. And where that's important is it helps us understand, can we interrupt the transmission of the virus from one person to another, and therefore reduce and essentially prevent transmissions in the population. So to help us understand that, we've created this BC Hepatitis Testers cohort, where we basically took de-identified health information for about 1.5 million British Columbians tested for hepatitis C and other illnesses such as HIV and hepatitis B and tuberculosis. And it includes all of their lab, almost all of their lab test results and their medical visits, hospitalizations, prescriptions, cancer outcomes, and mortality. And we have 25 years, approximately, of information. It helps us understand the cost of the services and the health outcomes by different groups. And it's one of the most comprehensive in the world. And basically, what we're trying to do is to bridge science and genomics to help us prevent hepatitis C and cure infections so that within the next decade or 15 years from now, we will eliminate hepatitis C. So we've gone from an undiscovered agent to the potential to eliminate this virus uh, all within about 25 years. And to do that, we need to learn how to prevent infection amongst younger people, harm reduction, interrupt, interrupt transmission networks, potentially use treatment as prevention because a cured person can't transmit their infection. And do you spend the dollars here in reducing transmissions? And at the same time, we know that many of us, baby boomers, one in 33 of you, could be infected with hepatitis C. And for those people, they need to be tested, they need to be diagnosed, and we need to prevent serious liver disease, liver cancer, and the need for transplant by using these new curative antivirals. So, as Brad highlights, it's about scientific discovery, better health, and translating those into better programs and policies, and you shouldn't be one of these greedy livers drinking beer because that's a toxin. Thank you. <laughs>